I'm going to have to admit, this is going to be a fun sermon for me to preach. Um, I'm looking forward to this. And uh, it's not even something I've been thinking about for a very long time, but it's something that comes up from time to time. And what we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at biblical records and things, God's instruction for preachers on things to say and how to preach. Because one of the things that turns people up, and I've heard this before, you know, about independent, fundamental Baptists, like, oh, you guys aren't very loving, right? Or, well, I don't know, why do you have to yell? Or why do you have to, you know, why do you have to do these things, right? Well, I don't understand why, why can't you just, you know, pull up a bar stool, sit down, and have a chat with me? Because that's the way that, I mean, this is how the, the, the liberal community churches and stuff, I mean, that's how they do it, right? There's, there's no change or fluctuation in their voice. It's all just pretty monotone, pretty chill, you know, and there's a good reason why preaching is done the way it is in this church and in many other churches. And, you know, and I know nobody here tonight is, uh, you know, I'm kind of preaching to the choir in a sense. But it's still important to understand this because everything that we believe or what, you know, if you're ever challenged on this, you should know what Scripture says and why we do things the way we do. Everything that we do here. There's a reason for why we do things. There's a reason why we sing hymns unto God in church. There's a reason why we even take up an offering. There's a reason why we do the things we do. It's not just for no reason. And it's all based on Scripture and Scripture. And you know, even down to the way that I preach the sermons. Now, does that mean that I'm perfect? Does it mean that everything we do in church is perfect? No. I'm sure we're going to have some problems, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not say, you know, saying that I'm the best preacher and I'm perfect and I don't make any mistakes. Of course not. But there are some way, you know, the, the styles of preaching and, and the way things are done, sometimes people have to work at that. I did have to work at that for one. For, I still do work at it. I've, I, you know, as far as the, uh, the personality that I've had, I've never been one to get super animated and, you know, be the center of attention and everything like that and be some speaker. That's never, that was never my gift or my, you know, so I had to really work at being able to preach and look at the way that God would have me to preach. I mean, everything that we do in life, we ought to be looking at, well, how does God want me to do this? Right? God has a special plan. Now, he gives us a lot of liberty and freedom in many areas of our life and the way that we serve him. But he also gives us instruction and he gives us principles and he gives us things to follow of, well, this is the way I want you to do this. So, you know, in certain areas, there's ways he says, you know what, do it this way. And when he tells us how to do it, let's do it that way. And we're going to look at some examples tonight from, from various great men of God. And we're going to see how it lines up. We're just going to look at them. We're, first, we're going to look at a few statements, that, the instructions that God has specifically given. In this chapter, in Ezekiel chapter 6, God explicitly gave Ezekiel a, a, an instruction on how he was to deliver his message. In verse number 11, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord. So who's speaking? Who's giving the commandment here? God. Thus saith the Lord God. Smite with thine hand. And stamp with thy foot, saying, listen to me. Now, if you're stomping with your foot and slamming with your hand, you think he's going to be like, okay, guys, I got something for you. <laughs> okay, okay, listen up. He's going to be like, no, listen up. This is important, right? This, it, it, it's to grab attention. It's, it's to get a point across because you could be saying the right words in your preaching, but but oftentimes, in order to convey the seriousness of a situation, you need to get a little bit more animated. You need to get a little bit more excited. And God said, hey, look, stamp with your foot. Stamp with your foot and, and smite with thine hand. It means hit. You're smiting with your hand. People need to wake up. And oftentimes in preaching, you know, people kind of drift off, right, and just not be paying that much attention. Well, that's going to get some attention. Well, whoa, okay, what's going on? Maybe this is something I should pay attention to. And with, especially in this message particularly that Ezekiel was given, it's not a good message. It's not a popular message. It's not one that people are going to want to hear. 
because it's all about destruction. It's all about doom. It's a, hey, God's angry with you and he's gonna bring his judgment with you. But that is the type of message that people need to listen to. You need to hear that, why? Because we need to get right with God and hope that God, the God of mercy will look at us if we could repent, if we could change, if we could get right with God and he'll say, okay, maybe he'll withhold what we deserve from us and, and hold back and see, wow, these people are actually listening and getting right with God. That's the purpose. The purpose of the strong preaching, our preaching is for people to get right with God. When God sent Jonah to Nineveh, it was a negative message. Hey, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Said, God's going to destroy Nineveh. But why did he send Jonah? Why did he go through all the efforts when Jonah didn't want to do it to get Jonah? No, you go and preach this message. He went through a lot of efforts just to get Jonah to go and do it. Because his word needed to be preached and the people ended up listening. They heard a hard sermon. They heard some hard preaching. They heard the destruction message. And instead of saying, get out of here, Jonah, we don't want to hear that garbage. We, you know, we don't care what your God says. They actually listened to him and they got right. And guess what? Nineveh remained. They repented at the preaching of Jonah. That's the point. That's the purpose. So what we see here is God instructing Ezekiel and saying, look, smite with your hand and stamp with thy foot and say, alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel. What's he doing? He's calling out their sins. He's saying, look, you're committing abominations in the sight of God. For they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. God's not mocked. And people need to understand that. And sometimes you need to stop your foot on the ground and smite with your hand to get people's attention because it's that important. So that's kind of just instance number one. Turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 58. This is one bit of instruction. You say, yeah, but that was just for Ezekiel. That was just for that message. Let's look at some more examples and see if God intended for that style of preaching to only be used this one time because I don't buy that. We can look at all of the instruction God gives, and it's not that many times where he's telling them specifically. He's telling them a lot of times what to say because it's the word of the Lord. And honestly, that is the most important. You could get someone slamming their hands down and stomping their foot and preaching a false gospel, <laughs> and it's not of God, and you shouldn't listen to any word. You know, I don't care if they got the dynamics down if they're just completely false. The word is primary and most important. I'd much rather listen to someone who was really boring and didn't use any fluctuation, you know, didn't raise their voice, didn't stomp with their feet, didn't do any of that, but they're actually preaching a good message, they're preaching God's word, than someone you know, doing all these things and not preaching God's word. Obviously, the primary importance is on the focus on scripture. But Specifically, what I'm covering tonight is, is, is some of the things I've heard. Well, people, I don't like going to a Baptist church because of this and because of that and because of this preaching. Because I don't like, why do they have to preach like that? Well, this is why. This is, what, this is why I preach the way I do. This is, this is why. This is one great verse. Not the only verse. We're going to look at some more. But this is one reason why. Ezekiel chapter 6, God said, hey, smite with your hand. Stamp with thy foot. It was a good instruction for Ezekiel. It was a good instruction for us today. Get people's attention. Why? Because the message is that important. Isaiah 58, look at verse number one. Instruction to Isaiah, cry aloud. Now, you have to understand when you're reading the King James Bible and it says cry, it's not talking about weeping. It's never talking about weeping. When you, hear, when you see the word cry or crying, it's raising up your voice and like it's crying out. That's what crying is. You're, you're, you've, lift, you've raised up the volume of your voice Basically, it's like yelling. I mean, it's, it, it, you're speaking in, in, a, in a much more elevated volume than you normally would. That's all it means. Cry aloud. Spare not. He's saying don't hold back. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Now, a trumpet's pretty loud. It's one of the louder instruments. You got someone blowing a trumpet in this room. If someone were to blow a trumpet in this room right now, it would be really loud. Un, unmuzzled, you blow a trumpet here, it's gonna be really loud. And God's saying, hey, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. One of the jobs of a preacher ought to be to point out sin, point out the problem areas, point out, preach on these things that, hey, 
we need to hear this and you need to hear it good. You need to sit down, you need to listen to someone who's going to lift up their voice and just scream and yell about sin. Why? Because none of us are perfect and we all need to keep on getting our act together in serving, to, in serving the Lord. Everybody needs this. And I thank God, I thank God for leading me to a church after many years of being saved that actually did that. And why do I thank God? Because my life changed dramatically once I finally got under that type of preaching. Because when you get into a church and you hear a message, not a lot of zeal. It's almost like the preacher doesn't care that much. I mean, that's the impression you might leave with. Maybe they really do. But when they're, when they're not, you know, don't seem to care as much about it, doesn't seem to impact them personally. You know, when I preach about especially things, I've noticed with certain sermons that I preach, I feel like I preach better on things that really hit home to me because I'm more passionate about it and, and it really matters. And, you know, I should be like that. And again, if I were a perfect preacher, I should be like that with everything because every word of God, every truth of God should matter to me just like all these other issues do. But I'm not perfect. But when, for example, if I preach on alcohol, you better believe there's going to be some passion in my sermon. Why? Because that was something that was a big influence in my life. Or on rock music. These are things that, that I was a part of for a long time and I hate now I hate them. I hate the damage that it's caused. I hate the destruction. I've known firsthand, and I want to have nothing to do with it. And, you, and, and that impacts me personally. You're going to hear a little extra <laughs> about, about some of these subjects. We ought to hate all sin. But I'm just, I'm just saying, there, you know, there's things that are really important that people need to hear. You need to hear the, the, the voice lifted up like a trumpet and, and shown your sins. And anyone who has a heart to serve God, a heart to know what's right and wrong, is going gonna, is gonna to want to hear that type of preaching. Because I don't know about you, but I know that I don't want to be doing things that are wrong in God's sight. And sometimes the only way to really get that through our thick skulls is for it to just be shouted at you. Shake you up a little bit and be like, whoa, man, okay. Because if you just say something sometimes, oh, this is a sin or that's a sin, it doesn't always have the same impact on you. You say, well, yeah, lots of things are sins. I'm a sinner. But when you hear someone just screaming and shouting about how, you know, alcohol is going to destroy your life, you know, get away from it, run as far away as you can from it because it's going to, you know, that's going to have a different impact on you. And look, I could say all these reasons and explanations all I want, but ultimately we have two examples now in scripture of God explaining to Ezekiel and to Isaiah how they're supposed to deliver these messages, how they're supposed to preach to them. And this is what we base everything that we are doing on is, is scripture, is God's word. Now, was these, were these commands given every single time anyone ever said anything? No. Is an entire sermon that I preach just always at volume 10? No, of course not. But, the, but there are times when this is necessary and this is appropriate and this is the way that we ought to preach. And we can see in both instances it has to do with hitting on the sin and making sure people just, just get that through their heads. Turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter number 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, we're going to see some instructions that God gave to, preach, you know, to these preachers, to Ezekiel and to Jeremiah and what their job was and uh, what God expected of them as preachers. And we're looking at biblical preaching styles tonight. So we start off, we get these, you know, the loud preaching, the pulpit pounding, and preaching God's word, and preaching a lot of God's word. That's another thing you'll notice that we do here that, that may be different from other churches is that we are going to turn to and look at and read a lot of Scripture. Because I'm not interested, and I'm sure you're not interested either that much, at least, in just all of my thoughts and my opinions and everything that I think. 
as much as you're interested in what does the Word of God say. Because <laughs> that's what I care about, too. I care about what does the Word of God say. And that's why I pour over these sermons and try to do the best I can to, pr to pull everything together and say, well, let, here, you know, I, it's a big book. I'm not just going to spend the time and just be like, well, let's see, what does God say about preaching? No, it's all going to be prepared. We're going to go through it, and, and then I'm going to show you guys, hey, look at this, look at this, look at this, and try to prove the point of this is sound doctrine, this is biblical, because here, 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 the God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word. And that's the way, and that's the way things are done here. So look at verse, or chapter number one in Jeremiah, verse number six. The Bible says, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. This is, this is Jeremiah answering God after God already told him that he wants him to go and preach. And he's saying, God, you know, I'm just a child. You know, I can't speak. And this is, this is the answer that I would have had, too. I can't do that. I'm not a preacher. I can't speak. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. And that's the key to a good preacher. Hey, whatever God's saying, you know, just focus on his words. We don't have to worry as preachers what other people think, what they're going to do with the information, whether they accept it, whether they reject it, whether they leave the church, whether they stand up and walk out in the middle of service. Not our problem. Our problem is answering to God for preaching what he said to preach. That's the job of the preacher. And that's what he says. He, and, he, and he tells them, he's trying to warn them and say in verse 8, look, be not afraid of their faces. And if you've ever preached a hard sermon before people before, you'll understand what this is talking about. Because you'll have people that will give you nasty looks. <laughs> and they don't like what you're saying. And they'll make sure you know that by the expression on their face. And a natural, if you're in the flesh, a natural tendency might be, well, I don't want this person to be upset with me. So you're going to censor what you say and maybe hold back. But if you're in the spirit, you're just going to do what God told you to do. And that's their problem. And if someone has a problem with God's word, Take that up with God. I don't care. You can give me all the dirty faces you want, but, but the problem's not with me. The problem's with this book. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. God, God's saying, look, I won't let them hurt you. You do what I'm telling you to do, I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. They could be making gestures to you like, you know, like they're going to kill you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm taking care of you. And I'll trust God over anyone <laughs> when it comes to my personal safety. I'll put all my trust in the Lord. Verse number nine, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. Now, those first four things that he's saying I'm, I, that I want you to do, Jeremiah, root out pull down, destroy, and throw down. They're destructive. And again, nobody likes to hear the destructive messages of, you know, what are you doing? We're trying to build ourselves up. He's tearing down the sinful things, the worldly things, the, the idolatry. He's like, I want you to get rid of that stuff. We need to tear that down before we can actually build. Because everyone's excited about the building. Well, I don't know. Some, that's not necessarily true. Because I'm, I'm, I'm always excited about the demo part, actually, probably even more than the building. But He's like, we need to tear this stuff down in order to build and in order to plant. We need to start right, and we need to get rid of all this nonsense. And that's, you know, going to be coming from his mouth. He's not physically going and doing this stuff with his hands. He's preaching to tear down. He's preaching to destroy. He's preaching all of that stuff. And then he's going to also be preaching, hey, now we need to build, we need to plant, let's get things going the right way. And this is the job of the preacher. Look at, turn if you go to Ezekiel chapter 2. But see, all of that wisdom is coming from God. He's saying, you just preach my message. This is what you're going to end up doing. You're going to be rooting, down, rooting up and, and rooting out, pulling down, destroying, throwing down. And there's going to be people that aren't going to want to hear it. But just do what I tell you to do. Just preach it. Preach it anyways. 
And we know the reason to preach it anyway is because God's word is powerful. You could have 99 people that don't want to hear it, but you got one that does. Praise God for that one. That one person's important. Or those two, or those 10, or however, however many it is, right? The minority is still very important. At one point, that minority was you before you got saved. Ezekiel chapter 2. Verse number 5. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 5. More instructions. that We saw some instructions of Jeremiah. We're going to see very, very similar instructions to Ezekiel. Verse number 5. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear... For they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. He's basically saying, you just need to preach this. Whether they're going to listen to you or not, you need to preach. He's saying, I already know they're rebellious. I already know what I'm sending you into here. And he tells him, verse 6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Now, neither one of the, you know, he, he, when he's giving them instructions about not being afraid of their faces, not being afraid of their words, what type of message do you think he's preaching? Is it going to be one where he's patting them on the back and telling them how great they are? No, of course not, because God wouldn't even tell him this stuff if everything was just all positive and all loving and, and everything's going great. He only needs these instructions about being aware of people being really angry with you because he's sending, them to he's sending him to preach a message that is going to make people angry. And unfortunately, there are people today that will tell you, oh, don't you know you're going to offend people with the things that you say? Don't you know that people are going to get angry? You shouldn't say those things because you, you shouldn't be trying to provoke people to be angry with you. Well, that's half right because we're not trying. It's not our intent to just get people angry or provoke them to anger. However, if I know that what I preach is going to make people angry, but it's God's word, guess what? I'm preaching it anyways. It's going to come out. It's going to happen. Because that's my job as a preacher of God's word. Just preach it all. He's the one who made it, not me. So, so when you come into a church like this, you're going to hear a lot of preaching against sin. You're going to hear a lot of yelling. You're going to see some you know, pulpit pounding. You're going to maybe see some stamping of a foot. You're going to hear a loud voice. And be like, wow, that's loud. Why? Because this is the way God's instructing preachers to preach his word. That's why. We're trying to follow scripture as best as we can. Let's keep reading here in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse number 7 says, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee, saying, you don't be like them. You do what I tell you to do. They're not doing what I'm telling them to do. They're not receiving my word. They're not listening to me, but you better not be like them. He says, you receive my word and you do what I'm telling you to do. And that's a warning for every preacher out there too, by the way. We need to be doing what God's telling us to do and not withholding, not sparing, as the Bible said. Spare not. Cry aloud. Spare not. Don't hold back. And when I looked, behold, verse number nine, and hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein. So this is the message that he's being told to eat so that he could repeat it. Right? This is the message from the word of God. What I saw written therein, lamentations and mourning and woe. Well, Ezekiel, that's not going to make you very popular. <laughs> that's not going to make you popular with man. No, it's not. Because that's not a popular message. But it's needful. It's what God wants you to preach. Now, again, okay, we are looking at very specific examples. There are times in many places, and you'll find them throughout the Bible, where, where edification, lifting up, exhorting, encouraging, praising God for his goodness, for his mercy, for his long-suffering, all of these, these good things that people do like to hear that is generally accepted 
far and wide because they're positive, good things also need to be preached because that's important too. If it's in God's word, it's all important. And, and you'll hear that as well because it is. But we're going to do our best to focus on the things that God focuses on. We're going to do our best to, you know, however much time that the scriptures spend on different various topics, we're going to try our best to also spend that a relative amount of time on, on each thing so that we can be balanced in our Christian, not focus just everything on one point and be just completely off balanced. Let's get a full view of God. Let's understand everything that is being taught here and um, apply it to the things that we do. Uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 3. Another thing that, that people have a problem with in our preaching sometimes can be the ridiculing or mocking of false prophets, false teachers. Well, we've got examples for that. Now, some of these we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at mostly examples the rest of the way. I wanted to really make sure we point out the clear instruction, because these are clear instructions from God's word about lifting up your voice and, and smiting your hand and things like that. You can't, I mean, I don't see how you could argue with that. These are clear instructions from God on methods of preaching, biblical preaching styles. It's biblical. It's, it's something that he said to do. Now, we have to keep in mind that every example of a person doing something in the Bible is not always necessarily right. Okay, we need to keep that in mind. So as I give you examples... I'm not, you know, there, you have to prove things with more than just an example that a person did because people are sinful and the Bible records sinful things that people do, okay? However, we can't always just assume that they're sinful either, right? I mean, we, we're going we're gonna to see both and what we're going to do and one of my points of looking at the examples is, well, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at Jesus because we know that nothing, no example that Jesus set was wrong in any way or sinful at all because Jesus didn't have any sin. So the way that he did it was perfect. And we're going to spend a lot of time on Jesus' preaching methods. But a couple of the other guys we're going to look at and understand that if we see a pattern here among God's men preaching God's word, then it's pretty safe to say it's probably a good example if it's not just a one-off. Calling out the false prophets, naming them, marking them, avoiding them is all scriptural. But even just kind of ridiculing or mocking them, we see Elijah doing that in one of my personal favorite stories in the whole Bible in 1 Kings chapter 18. You don't have to turn it, have you? In Matthew, stay in Matthew 3. 1 Kings 18, 27, though, if you remember, when, when it was just pretty much Elijah against all the prophets of Baal, and they're over there, and, and the thing was they needed to uh, offer up a sacrifice, and God was going to answer by fire. And they say, whoever, you know, whoever actually answers by fire, that is the true God. Because the Baal worshipers were saying, oh, Baal's the true God. And, and you know, Elijah's saying, the Lord, he's the God. And the Baal worshipers are over there and they're cutting themselves and they're doing all this stuff and they're dancing around and they're, you know, they're doing all their rituals and trying to, you know, all their Satan worship and, and, and doing whatever they can to try to get Satan to, to bring fire down. And it's not working. And Elijah's having a good time with this. Because these are all, I mean, think about this. It, it, it's comical, it's kind of funny, but here's one of the reasons why it's not that bad of a thing because these false prophets are sending people to hell. They've got a false god, they're Satan worshipers, and they're trying to get other people to follow Satan. So making fun of them a little bit really isn't that big of a deal. And here's what Elijah did in, in 1 Kings 18.27. It says, it came to pass at noon, so they've had like all morning to do this. So noon rolls around, and Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he's in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. He's saying, yeah. Scream a little bit louder because, you know, your God, you know, he, maybe he's just on the phone. Maybe he's just talking with someone. You need to get his attention. He might be taking a nap, right? Wake him up. Come on. Cry a little bit louder. And, he, and he's just, he's, he's razzing him, right? Why? Because they're foolish. Because he knows who the right God, he knows the Lord is God. And they're wicked and they're sending people to hell and they're Satan worship. 
and there's nothing wrong with, with mocking them a little bit. So uh, that's one thing that you hear mocking of false prophets. I say, well, look what Elijah did. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to see an uh, example of John the Baptist. And we're going to see some more correlation, especially with the crying out. Okay, and, and notice as we go through these, I may not always make a mention of it, but we're going to see these examples. Here's going to be John the Baptist, and the rest of these is going to be Jesus. And notice as we read these passages when it says that they cried or they cried out because that means that they're raising their voice. And you're going to find that Jesus did it many, many times. And John the Baptist did it. And we're only looking at very specific examples here. And you can find them all throughout the Bible. I had to pick and choose which ones I wanted to include. Okay? It's not, this is by no means comprehensive of all the times you could find them raising their voices or, or saying some of these things. So keep that in mind as well. I had a hard time, you know, trying to, to pick the best ones that I thought would be you know, good to, to share to get a good understanding of many of the ways that they were preaching in the Bible and comparing that to how things ought to be preached today. So Matthew 3, verse number 1, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bible says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So that Old Testament prophecy that there was going to be a prophet coming, crying in the wilderness, a voice crying, it means he's yelling. Okay, John the Baptist was a fulfillment of this prophecy, which means, what was he doing? Crying in the wilderness, yelling out, preaching and preaching loudly out in the, in the wilderness. He was in the desert. He was out in, in, a, in a remote area and he was preaching. Verse number four, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So he's doing a great work for God and people are coming out to him and they're getting baptized. They're getting, you know, they're getting saved. They're going out there and they're hearing John preach and he's crying out in the wilderness. Verse seven, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, so now he sees the false prophets of his day, these Pharisees and Sadducees, not the, you know, Elijah was mocking the Baal worshipers. Well, these are other false prophets. He said unto them, what did he say? Oh, I'm going to be really nice to you and, and talk to you real friendly because I don't want to make you mad at me. Oh, wait, no. He said, oh, generation of vipers. He called them a bunch of snakes. Oh, but that's not very loving. That's not very Christ-like. Well, we'll see in a little bit if it's Christ-like. We'll see, we'll, see, we'll see some of the things that Jesus Christ said to these people too, okay? We need to be careful what we judge. Look, judging is not wrong, but we need to judge righteous judgment as Jesus Christ himself said. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And unfortunately, there's people who... They hear this type of preaching and it turns them off and, and maybe something that was said offends them or whatever. I don't want to go back to that church because they offend me. And I, you know, I can't believe this. Read your Bible. Read your Bible and read some of the things that were said. And yeah, it, you know, it's going to be a lot easier for you to read this. Oh, well, that's okay because they're not preaching it to you. But had you been alive in those days, who knows? You'd be hearing it coming out of their mouth. You'd be hearing them yelling. You wouldn't just be reading it in the book. You'd be hearing that voice in the wilderness crying out. You'd be hearing them calling people vipers. Oh, I can't believe he said that. Well, he did. Look, this is biblical. This is biblical preaching styles. Oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. And I just want to point this out real quick just because we're in this passage. When he's saying, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance... He's not just talking about like all of their works and, they go, and he's saying, oh yeah, see, this is how we tell if someone's saved if they're doing all these good works and stuff because he explains it. He says, bring forth fruits, meet therefore repentance. Verse number nine says, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able these stones to raise up children and hear him. Why? Because they were, they were worried about their genealogy and they trusted in the law of Moses and they trusted in the fact that they were children of Abraham to somehow make them special, that they were God's chosen people. And he says, no. 
No, bring forth forth. Don't, don't give me this line about you being a child of Abraham because that's not going to fly. Because you need to have your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to put your faith in the Lord. You need to put your faith in the Savior. That's what's going to get you saved. Not this trusting to Abraham being our father. And that's the fruits meet for repentance that he was talking about. That's why it has a colon after fruits meet for repentance defining what he's talking about. Because their belief was in something else. And he says, no, you need to show we, you know, we're not just trusting in Abraham. Come and tell me that you actually change what you believe and you're going to not be a Pharisee anymore who's trusting in, in Abraham and the law. You're going to be trusting in the Lord. You're going to be trusting by faith in your salvation from the Lord. Verse number 10, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat in the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John laid it out there, man. There's no misunderstanding what he's talking about these people. He's, he's spelling it out, and he's just preaching it, and he's crying out and preaching it straight. He's talking about hell. He's talking about, you know, good things, bad things. He's talking about, you know, his, his wheat being gathered up. Hey, praise God. He's talking about the chaff being, being cast into everlasting fire. He's saying it all. He's, he's calling out the false prophets saying these vipers, these snakes, these deceivers. What are you doing here? I know you don't believe. What are you doing here? Turn to John chapter 7. We're going to see some, a couple examples here of Jesus Christ crying out or yelling. Okay, we're going to see some preaching here from Jesus where the Bible specifically is mentioning that he cried out. Unfortunately, there's this picture being painted in people's minds of who Jesus was as some pacifist that walked around, never raised his voice, never got angry, you know, never did any of these things because that's what some sodomite painted a picture of him as and wants you to think that, oh, look, he's just, you know, would never, would never raise his voice for anything. Or he never got angry. Which, if you're reading one of the, you know, modern perversions, the NIV, basically makes Jesus a sinner because it, it, it takes out the, uh, the verse that says, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, that, it, that that's a sin. And they remove the without a cause phrase and just say, well, if you're angry with your brother. Well, Jesus was angry. Jesus got angry with his brother. But it wasn't without a cause. <laughs> there was a good cause for Jesus getting angry, which is why he was without sin. Because you could get angry when you have a good cause and not be in sin. Now, we're not supposed to let the sun go down upon our wrath. You know, we're not supposed to just keep and hold bitterness and be angry with people and just, just hold on to that. But you can be angry with people when you've got a good cause for it. There's nothing sinful about that. John chapter 7, look at verse number 25. The Bible said, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught. So what's he doing? He's teaching. He's preaching, and then what does he do? He cries out as he's teaching, saying, Ye both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. He's calling them out. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. See, it's easy as we read our Bibles to kind of pass over when it says, And he cried. Because we read. I mean, you read so much. And look, I, I'm sure I'm completely guilty of this. I do this probably all the time because you're trying to read and you're, and you're looking at different things. But we can't forget that this is what Jesus is actually, he literally was, was crying out and yelling this statement that, that, is, that is said right here. That's the way he delivered this message. That's the way he preached it. He yelled it out. Verse number 30, and they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. 
Him saying that and yelling that made a lot of people angry. Guess what? Jesus knew it was going to make people angry, and he said it anyways. And, and this is what, what irritates me is when people are, oh, but there's a, diff there's a better way to, to, to preach. You can do this without making anyone angry. Well, if you're, if you're preaching without making anyone angry, you're doing it wrong. Okay? Beware when, men, when all men shall speak uh, highly of you. Well, speak greatly because that's what they did to the false prophets. Jesus said, you're blessed when, you, when you're persecuted and your name's cast out as evil for my name's sake. When people are, 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 are tearing you down and saying all manner of evil against you falsely, he says, that's a good thing. You're doing something right. He's saying, because that's the way they treated the prophets. That's the way all the holy men of God were treated. Not well. So no, I'm not going to listen to people who say, oh, well, don't yell, oh, don't say, don't say this, don't say that, don't yell. But if you offend them, maybe they'll never come back to church. Well, maybe they could take that up with God because they're wrong. I'm not going to change the way that God instructed me to preach because someone might leave and never come back. That's their problem, not mine. It would be my problem if I was doing something that is not found in Scripture and it's my fault. If I'm, if I'm preaching things or I'm preaching in a way or I'm preaching in a way that's just completely not biblical and someone leaves because of my flesh or because of my own opinions and, and things like that, then that could be on me. I, I, I could agree with you on that. But when I'm doing things from biblical examples and biblical models and biblical statements and someone gets offended and leaves, that's on them. And look, I don't want people to get up and leave. Especially when there's not a lot of people here. But I'm not going to change unless I see anything in God's word why I need to change. I'm not, I'm not going to change my preaching style because that's already established. I'm already convinced of that. And um, you have a good time trying to, trying to prove me different in the scripture. John chapter 12. I want to get to some other points. I'm spending a little bit more time on, on some of these things than I wanted to. John chapter 12, verse 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. And he goes on and on. I'm a light to the world. You know, and, and you can read that. But my point is that Jesus cried out in this instant also. It's not just a one-off. It's not just one time he raised his voice. It's many times. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. We're going to see a good example here of sometimes, even when Jesus knew there was going to be a strong reaction and many people are going to be upset, he made it a point to do or to say something that angered the people. He actually made a point to do it. He knew that it was going to make people upset. He knew it was going to make them angry. He knew it was going to make them infuriated. But he did it anyways, on purpose, because it was going to make them angry. To make a point, again, the preaching style of saying something or doing something to prove a point we're going to see here established in Luke chapter 6 with, again, the perfect example that we could ever see, Jesus Christ himself. Luke 6 is basically uh, one, of the time, one of the many times that people got upset for Jesus Christ healing on the Sabbath day because people were wrong about what was allowed on the Sabbath day. And healing was allowed, and they were trying to say that, that it wasn't, and, you know, Jesus was in sin and all this other stuff by healing somebody on the Sabbath. Look at verse number 6 of Luke 6. The Bible says, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him. So you got these wicked people just, wa just waiting, right? They're just waiting to pounce on him. We're going to find something that he's going to do wrong here, and we're, we're going to get him. Whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. Oh, look, here's someone. Here's someone who's lame. Here's someone that's got a problem. Let's see if he, Jesus heals him. Not to glorify God and say, wow, praise God for sending someone that can come and heal people. No, they're going to take something good and try to turn it on its head and use it against Jesus Christ. Whether he'd heal on the Sabbath day, they, they might find an accusation against him. Verse number eight, but he knew their thoughts 
So Jesus knew this, okay? He already knew. It's not something that he did and then, oh, well, he was just preaching. He didn't intend to make people angry. Yes, he did. He knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. He already knew they're watching him. He already knew that they want to, to accuse him of something. So Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to make this really public. Hey, you, come on up here. Come on up and stand right here. You with the withered hand. He's making a, a very strong point on what he's doing, is he not? He didn't just subtly heal the guy. He says, oh, no, no, oh, you're going to try to hold this against me? Okay, here, let's just, let's just shout it from the rooftops of what I'm going to do here, okay? Because, why? Because he was right. Verse number nine, then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And of course, no one's going to answer him, right? And he's saying, well, what's right? What's right to do on the Sabbath day? Verse number 10, and looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Now look, they're looking for him to do work on the Sabbath so they could accuse him. He told him to stretch forth his hand, and it was, you know, like, Obviously, they know that Jesus was responsible for the healing, but like, what work did he even do? You know what I mean? Like, he just said, stretch forth thy head. He didn't even go up to him and like bandage him up or do anything that, that would be even remotely considered work from, I think, a normal person's perspective. Now, again, again, he obviously did it, and he did the healing, and if you want to call that a work, so be it. But, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing about the Sabbath and what, you know, what was allowed. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But it was totally legitimate and righteous for him to do that, for people to heal on the Sabbath. He's trying to bring this point up and prove, look, is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? Of course it's lawful to do good. And uh, in verse 11, look, it says, and they were filled with madness. Madness doesn't mean they were crazy. It means they were so upset and infuriated. It's just like, you know, the English, like, are you mad? Like, are you, you know, they were filled with madness. It really bothered them so much. It says, and commune one with another what they might do to Jesus. What are we going to do about this guy? Man, it makes me so mad. He called him up in front of everybody and he healed him on the Sabbath day. Jesus knew he was going to get that reaction in advance and he did it anyways. It's not wrong for a preacher to even know in advance that some things are going to set some people off because if you're right and if you're preaching God's word, you're doing it right, Jesus did it right. Sometimes you really need to drive home a point and make a stand and be like, there is no confusion over this matter. Why? Because a lot of people were listening to him. It wasn't just the Pharisees. He was making a point publicly and just saying, this is where I stand on this issue. Oh, this, this idea of healing, oh, I don't know. Because you might have other people, they're hearing the Pharisees, they're hearing Jesus, and they're going, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to break the Sabbath, and I don't know what's right. And Jesus is saying, this is right. You can heal somebody on the Sabbath day and not break the Sabbath. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 3, because this is a parallel passage to this same thing, and I want to point this out because it's not recorded in Luke 6, but the same story that's found in Mark chapter 3, we're going to see Jesus was actually angry. Because I've heard that before. Oh, that preacher, he's just so, he's so full of anger, and you know when he preaches, he's just angry, and people go as far as to label someone an angry person based on the way that they preach. And it's like, no, they're not an angry person. It's not, you know, because the Bible, it is a sin to just be an angry person. Just being angry all the time, full of anger, that is a sin. That's, that's not right. But basing whether or not a person is an angry person based on how they preach God's word, because they get angry sometimes, because they get ang righteous, have righteous anger towards sin and wickedness. No, you can't just label someone an angry person because you, you hear a few, you know, cli video clips from someone that's, that they're, they're really angry about sin and wickedness. We ought to hate sin. 
We ought to hate wickedness. We, I mean, that's righteous. We ought not to just be angry people all the times in our lives, but especially when you're preaching God's word and, and you know, you're preaching on sin, it makes sense to be angry. And in this situation with these people, what Jesus knew their thoughts, Jesus Christ was angry. It bothered him so much that he was angry and Jesus doesn't sin. So go ahead and, and try to explain that one to me. Mark chapter three, verse number one. The Bible says, and he entered again into the synagogue and there was a man there which had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto him, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Same exact story, a little bit different information provided for us there. He looked on them and he was angry and he was grieved at the same time. He was grieved because their hearts were so hard and it's not going to get through to him. But he was angry at the same time while he was preaching because they were so foolish to try to accuse him, set a trap for him, and, and preaching their, their false doctrine and their wickedness. You can get angry and preach and teach, and it's all an example. And Jesus did it. Luke chapter 11. Turn if you go to Luke chapter 11. We're going to see another attribute of Jesus Christ preaching and about not caring who he offended. We've already seen this, but we're going to see it even more explicitly, I believe, in Luke chapter 11. It's a great example. About him preaching a message that he knew would be offensive to people and still preaching it anyways. Going ahead and going forward with it. Not apologizing for what he said even when he finds out that people are offended. Someone actually comes and tells him, hey, did you know that they're offended? Not one time did Jesus say, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Never. Never. And you know what? You ought not to be ashamed of the word of God. If you're preaching righteously, if you're preaching God's word, if it's God's message and someone gets offended, don't ever backtrack on what you said. Don't ever say, oh, well, you don't understand, blah, blah, blah. No, it doesn't matter. Preach God's word, preach it all, preach like Jesus, do it unapologetically. Take it or leave it. That's your problem. I've done my job. And I'm doing it the best way to follow Jesus' example. He didn't hold back. He didn't change the way that he even said anything, even though he knew it would offend people. He did it anyways. Luke chapter 11, look at verse number 37. Oh yeah, and, and he didn't try to find the common ground well, you believe this and I believe this and okay, well, we could agree on this area and just focus on that. He didn't do that ever. He just always preached what was right. If people agreed with him, well, great, you're right too then on that. And if people disagreed with him, he still said it anyways. We don't, we don't need to, to get so super political with our, with our beliefs and our Christianity. And beware of this too. When you go out soul winning, don't, you know, when people don't believe the gospel or any aspect of it, you don't have to just focus on, well, you're in agreement with me on the Trinity. You agree with me on it. You know, like, tell them all of it. And especially with the gospel, focus on the things where they don't agree with you on instead of the things where they do because they need to get right on the things that they disagree on. They need to get right that it's not of works. They need to get right that it's eternal. They need to, you know, these are the things that, that they need to hear. Don't be so soft or political that you just care about what people think about you so much that you're worried about offending them. Hey, and tell the person that doesn't want to hear the gospel or tell, tell the person that, that doesn't want to change their mind about works not being involved that they're going to hell. Warn them. Why? Because that's our job is to warn people. And I know no one likes to be told they're going to hell. I know that. I've told enough people that, to know that it's not the pleasant thing to do. Okay? 
Now, obviously, there's ways of saying things where you can just completely try to be a total jerk about it in ways to not, but either way, the truth is the truth and it needs to be told. And you don't have to make an apology for it either. I always try to make clear that people don't think that I'm condemning them to hell just because I think I could cast people to hell. Some people have that weird thought that, oh, you're sending me to hell. Look, I'm not sending you to hell. But the Bible says you're going to hell unless you believe this, what it says. So anyways, Luke chapter 11, look at verse number 37. We're going to see another example here from Jesus Christ. Almost done. I may not get to the last example, even though I think it's one of the best ones. Luke chapter 11, look at verse 37. The Bible says, And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So the Pharisee's looking at him and saying, wow, he didn't wash his hands. Because the Pharisees held that, like, they held to the commandments of men more than commandments of God. And God never commanded that you had to wash your hands before dinner. Kids, dad commands you to wash your hands before dinner. <laughs> but God didn't. So you're not, you're, you're not uh, sinning against God, per se, unless you're disobeying your parents. Then you are still sinning against God. So, sorry. But adults... When your parents aren't over you, you don't have to wash your hands before you eat because that's what Jesus did. <laughs> right? It's not a sin. The Pharisees up elevated that to, to being, you know, on par with God's word or something. But anyways, uh, I'm getting off. I'm totally getting off track here. He marveled that he not washed not before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. So Right off the bat. Look, this guy just invited you to dinner, Jesus. Can you be nice to him? <laughs> like, you haven't even started talking yet. And the first thing you say is, yeah, yeah, you guys are real good at cleaning up the outside, but the inside is rotten. Wicked. Verse 40, ye fools. He's calling them names. Oh, Jesus, that's not nice. Don't call them names. They're fools. Ye fools. Did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also, but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. They were covetous, and he knew it. They don't want to give alms. They want to keep all their stuff. Verse 42, but woe unto you, Pharisees, woe. Again, that's not positive. He's invited to dinner with the Pharisee. Oh, this is this great opportunity to get him saved. Don't offend him, whatever you do, Jesus. Is that what Jesus did? No. Now, was he preaching them the truth? Absolutely he was. But look at the way he did it. And remember these things when you're going to go and judge someone else or judge some other preacher. Are they following a biblical model, a biblical example? What is it that's really upsetting you? Is it the loud, the loud preaching that's upsetting to you? Or is it the actual message? Because I think most people that want to say, oh, well, that style of preaching isn't for me, really mean the content of the preaching isn't for me. But it's easier to cast blame on the person and them raising their voice than it is to point the blame at God's word. Because people generally don't want to admit to that, even if that's the truth. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. Or, uh, undone excuse me. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Now he's calling them hypocrites. He already called them fools. He already said that their inward part is full of ravening and wickedness in the first sentence. And now he's calling them hypocrites, for ye are his graves. He's like, you're like these graves that house dead people which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. He's saying, you are just full of dead, you know, inside you're so dead, but the people don't even realize that because you're not, you don't, you're not wearing the headstone to let people know there's a grave there. You've cleaned up the outside to make it look like you're not dead. He's like, but you're dead. You're full of rottenness. 
Verse 45, Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. Oh, 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 wait, you're going to talk this way to the Pharisees. If you're going to talk that way to them, then that means you're reproaching me too, because I'm a lawyer. What did Jesus say? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you lawyers. Wait, let's see what he actually said. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers. Okay, you want to get in on this too? Yeah, woe unto you, lawyers. You didn't, you didn't get enough for me, you know, saying woe and calling the, the Pharisees fool. Let, let's, let's divert the attention now to you, you lawyers. Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you. For ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. That's not very nice. But he's doing what needs to be done. Sometimes preaching God's word may not sound nice to people. But preaching what's needful for people is actually the most loving thing that you can do. It really is. Because if they hear it and receive it, it will help them more than being nice to them would. You can't, I don't see how you can be so nice if, if a person doesn't understand that their sins are going to damn them to hell. If you can't convince a person that they're actually not righteous, you know, there's people who are righteous in their own mind because of their works and because of everything that they've done, you're not going to, they're never going to get saved. They have to understand that they're not good enough. They have to. They have to. They have to be brought down. They have to be a base. They have to be brought low. In order to realize that, they, in order to accept a Savior, they have to accept that they're not good enough, that they need a Savior, that they actually deserve a punishment of hell. So being nice to that, you'd be nice to that person all you want, but if you're not going to be able to come out and love them enough to tell them, dude, you're on your way to hell, then how are they ever going to get saved? What, what, are, they, what are they even going to think they're being saved from? If they, if they can't acknowledge that fact. There's, there's no salvation without, without that understanding. Verse number 49, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel and the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge, and ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. This was at dinner. This is Jesus preaching at dinner. Unfortunately, people will hear that and be like, I'm not inviting Jesus to my house. <laughs> you are a fool then. I'd invite Jesus to dinner, even if he ripped face on me all, all night long. <laughs> Go ahead and do it. Let me know. Let me know where I need to, to, to make things better and right. And uh, last place, John chapter 6. I know we're running a little bit late, but I, I, I don't want to pass this up. But if you want to see some more, the, the parallel passage that we just read there is in Matthew 23. And Jesus is really laying it out in Matthew 23. Not everything is recorded in Luke 11, but he spends just verse after verse after verse saying, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And he just really just lays into them in Matthew 23 with all, with all of these areas that, that they were just completely wicked in. And he's just spelling it out for them, just laying it all out there. This is a preaching style, the preaching style of Jesus Christ himself. And if you're going to say that the things I say, oh, I'm not very kind, I'm going to point you to Jesus. And I want you to, you know, if, so, if someone's going to do that to me, and, and look, I know people here haven't, but it's just, you know, if you better come to me with something that, you know, Jesus wasn't doing, or else you're going to have to say that he wasn't kind either. And then I'm okay with that. If you're going to say, well, Jesus wasn't kind and you're not kind, 
you know, fine. Because <laughs> you could put me in the company with Jesus, and I, and I, would, I would love that. And, and if, I, if, I have, if I could share those attributes with him, then great. But Luke, or excuse me, John chapter 6, this is the, the content of this message was, was very controversial. Not just the style in, you know, raising your voice or crying out that can offend people. Oftentimes, it's the content. Why do you have to say things that way? Why, you know, well, these things are offensive. Why do you have to say this? Well, Jesus didn't make any excuse here in John 6 either, but he actually doubled down on what he said. John chapter 6 is a passage where he says, you know, I'm the bread of life. And he talks about the manna coming down from heaven. He's saying, I'm that manna. And, and he says, you know, you have to eat this bread in order to have eternal life. And then, he say, and then he goes on, he's just like, they're saying, well, how can we eat, you know? And he says like, my flesh is the bread, right? He didn't, he didn't back down, he goes even further. So let's, let's read through this pretty quick. I'll try to, to keep some of my commentary myself as we read through John chapter six. Look at verse number 28. I'll try to just hit the highlights. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Great salvation uh, verse right there. Verse number 30. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. You're saying, see, that's the, that's the sign that we had for Moses. But what about you? What sign do you have? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. He said, Moses didn't do that for you because they're trying to say, see, we could trust Moses because he had that sign. And Jesus is saying, Moses didn't do that. <laughs> he says, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. God gave you that, not Moses. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They didn't like that. They don't like his preaching. They're disapproving. They're murmuring. They're complaining. They're talking about it negatively. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? So now he's starting to get a little feedback on his preaching. How does he respond to that? Verse number 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the father which hath sent me Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Is he, is he leaving any room for doubt here? Or is he reiterating what he already just said? I am that bread of life. He's actually making it even a little bit clearer than he already had. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and they're dead. They ate manna, they're dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever in the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, okay, look, this was a hard teaching for these people to be able to accept and understand. And look at how much Jesus is just continuing to go just more and more extreme, if you will, in the way that he's explaining it. 
he didn't back off of it for a second. He actually continued to hit it even harder. Then Jesus said unto them, verse 53, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers that eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. He was preaching this. Basically, you know, I mean, you call it in a church service, right? He's in a synagogue and he's teaching and people are there to listen. And he's hearing feedback and people are kind of complaining about what he's preaching. And he just keeps on going more and more and more thoroughly into it and not backing down for a second. That's Jesus' preaching style. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? So even his disciples heard this, and they're like, whoa, what are you talking about? <laughs> they didn't get it at all. And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Now look, it's one thing for Jesus to not care about the unbelieving Pharisees, the false prophets that were probably reprobates anyways, right? You can, you can say, oh yeah, well, of course he's not going to care about them, but what about his disciples? Look at the attitude that he has even towards his disciples about regarding hearing and receiving his words. Doth this offend you? You're offended by what I say now? Now you're offended? Oh, follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to be offended at, at God's word? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of the Father. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. He preached a message that even his disciples were saying, we're not going to follow you anymore. He didn't go chasing after them. He didn't apologize. He preached the truth. And it's up to them to decide if they're going to stick around or not. And you know what? I'm going to do my best to preach the truth from God's word. And you can decide if you want to stick around or not. But don't expect me to change my preaching to suit your needs or anyone else's needs unless I can be corrected on suiting God's needs. And then look at what Jesus said unto the, tw even the 12, verse 67, then said Jesus unto the 12, will ye also go away? You guys going to go too? He didn't plead with them at all. He didn't apologize. He didn't back down. He just said, well, yeah, I preach it. I said it. Yep. And I went further and further and, and you better believe I said it. You guys want to go join those, those other disciples that left? And of course they didn't. You know, Peter answered and said, well, where are we going to go? You know, I mean, you've got the words of life. You know, who else are we going to go follow? Of course we're going to stay with you, right? And amen. I mean, of course they should have done that. But the disciples shouldn't have left. The other disciples shouldn't have left. But Jesus' attitude, this is what I want to just kind of point out, just, just my final point, just his attitude on it was, go ahead and leave. Which is why I hold the attitude of, I'm going to preach God's word, and if you, want to, if you get offended at God's word, go ahead and leave. I'm not going to chase you down. Now, I don't want you to leave. 
right? It's not my desire to just run everybody out of church. That's not the goal. But the goal is to preach the message, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. That's the instruction given to Jeremiah. It's the instruction given to Ezekiel. That's the instruction, I believe, given to any prophet of God. Preach God's word. Whether they hear or forbear. And the attitude of Jesus was, hey, if you're going to go, go ahead. And even the most faithful members, you want to go too? Go ahead. I'm going to try to do my best to do what's right by God. Anyways, I hope that helps give a little bit more information and, and you know, scriptural evidence as to why, we pre why I preach the way I do, why things are done this way. Other church, you know, it's not, definitely not our church only that preaches. Like, there's a lot of churches that preach like this, that, that use these styles, that look at this. I learn from other people, you know, this is found in scriptural. That's a scriptural evidence. So if you find yourself getting offended for some reason, first take a long look at yourself and at the Bible. If you're getting offended because a, 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 a pastor or a preacher is preaching false doctrine, and they're preaching you know, lies out of the Bible, okay, that's, you know, that's totally acceptable. But if it's because you don't like their style, because they're preaching the way that God instructed many people to preach in the Bible, you might want to check your heart and, and check Scripture and, and get that right with God. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the clear teachings that you give us, dear Lord, and that if we really want to know anything about any subject, we can just go straight to your word. Help us to read your words, to know your words, and to be able to reference whatever subject we can to, to, to find out answers uh, about dear Lord and, and help us to just know them better. Help us to retain your words in our heart so that when we read, it's not just kind of going in one ear and out the other, but help us to retain those things. Help us to put your words to use. And Lord, uh, we love you. And I pray, uh, especially God, that you would please help me to become a better preacher. You know my heart and you can see it, dear Lord. And um, I want to be used by you. And um, I know I have many faults and I just pray that you would please help me to work through them. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.